Hey everyone, want to welcome everybody to another Thursday, of course, Thursday night, seven o'clock central. We're a minute or two behind, but I promise you, this is well worth a couple of minutes late. We are with round two, episode two of my discussion with, of course, Christy Halk. And I'm so pleased that Christy had some time for us to revisit. We had so many awesome things we talked about uh, in our first go around several weeks back that frankly, we couldn't get it all in in, in an hour. So Christy, I wanna thank you for coming back tonight. I'm really looking forward for us picking up and uh, keep completing and going forward with our conversation. Yes, sir, Bernard, thank you. I'm so glad to be here and we covered so much ground but we left some things dangling. We, we certainly did. We talked a lot about the on-field and off-field football experience. We talked about uh, how you ended up uh, coming out of Marist and, uh, and Atlanta and coming over to Vanderbilt. We talk about several different game, uh, important games in, in during your career and in Vanderbilt's football uh, past. We talked about the cookie company and some of those experiences and how wonderful of a friend uh, you have been to the athletic department and to the football program. But we, what we really didn't talk about, and this is why we really wanted to come back tonight uh, to chat, was frankly the off the field experience and most notably your friendship with classmates and teammates Perry Wallace, uh, Taylor Stokes and many others who were during your time period maybe a little before a little after but there's so many uh, gosh there's so many stories that have yet to be be told but Christy I'm gonna I'm gonna hush up and I'm just gonna let you run with the ball for a little bit and well I'll chime in when I when I think I can actually contribute something of substance so Let's just pick back up where we were, and I know that we want to start maybe with, with Perry Wallace. Well, thanks, Bernard, and just use the hook when time has gone too far, okay? Yeah, we've uh, got an 8 o'clock out now. we got Kumar Rocker yeah, pitching against right. Arkansas in about 55 minutes, so let's That's go. Right. We'll go. Uh, well, I think it, it's important to stand on the shoulders of important people uh, in our past and whether you knew it or not, sometimes later you realize you were among really great people, but didn't realize it. And one of the people, I want to talk about two people tonight, but one was classmate Perry Wallace, who came in in 1966, same class as me. And um, I'm going to say this is your summer reading interview because there's going to be some assignments. And your first assignment is to read Strong Inside, if you haven't read it, by Andrew Marinus, class of 92. And Andrew spent eight years while working at a PR firm and re researching this book. And it is a mirror image of Perry's life, but also the four years we were at Vanderbilt. And it uncovered so many factoids, uh, issues, university, uh, opinions that we knew nothing about and this book just opened the eyes to everyone in our class and on our 45th reunion we all looked at each other and went this is you know we have to do something nobody realized what was going on with Perry with his friends on campus and when we read this book we were mortified so we established a scholarship our class did for Perry in an engineering school. It's the least we could do. But the lessons you learn is you really, um, Vanderbilt, you learned in the book, they did not have a policy on integration. The policy was no policy. It's going to be assimilate as normal students would. So you can read in the book, and that's fact-based. And it's, uh, you know, that nobody knew at the time what to do. <clears throat> there wasn't a policy, you know, there were no, everybody was sort of on their own. 66 was the third year of integration at Vanderbilt and the first year for athletes. And here comes Perry Wallace and Godfrey Dillard, two basketball players. Football was later in the game. And, um, as you when you go to college and you are you know trying to find your own way and make your own friends and uh, establish your own identity and, and trying to make the team and et cetera et cetera trying to go to school and then you know you don't if well 
years later, you would be smart enough to sit down and ask somebody, hey, you know, what's, what's your life like here? Or, but we did none of that. We were all friends with Perry Wallace. And as athletes in summertime, you play pickup basketball and we all played basketball together with him. And he was a great guy, nice as could be. His last game uh, as a senior, <clears throat> the day after, an interview was published with the Tennessean where he said how lonely he was and how discriminated he was. And he said, I'm, I'm, I, as soon as I get out of Vanderbilt, I'm leaving Nashville, leaving it behind. And we all went, whoa, wait a minute. We were all, you know, I thought we were friends. <laughs> well, we knew nothing. And so that's where Andrew's book just opened the eyes of all of us that read it. <clears throat> and some, some were smart enough to know beforehand, but we didn't, the most, most of us. So we learned a big lesson that he was, um, he had nowhere to go on campus. He was, there were very few African-Americans and what do they do on Saturday night? Well, what did we do? Everybody's going to fraternity parties, sorority parties, you're, you know, you're, you're going to the local pub. And, and back then it wasn't like, Hey, Perry, come along because if he goes to the local pub, people are going to get upset. So one of the, one of the kind of turning points of the book for me was when he, he, he was, you know, Perry went to Pearl high school in Nashville, one of the, uh, the greatest high schools at the time ever. All the parents, you know, on Saturdays would come and clean the school, the kids wore ties and, you know, they were, it was a top notch place. Perry was valedictorian of this, of this class. Uh, their, their basketball team won three straight national championships, not national, state championships. The third one was the first integrated and they wiped everybody off the map. They were great. And <clears throat> so he was a very religious man, and his family was. And so he goes to the local church next to campus. I think it was called the University Church, but it wasn't affiliated with Vanderbilt. And um, the pastor came to him several weeks later and said, I'm sorry, you have to leave. Because the commission, you know, our our our, um, our people are upset that you're here, and they're going to quit giving. And so they basically kicked him out of the church. And nobody knew that story until years and years later. Well, you know, I, that is just astounding. If we, you know, if we had known that, I'm sure. You know, we would have really been upset, but Perry was a dignified gentleman. He didn't say anything. He kept it all inside. And it was years and years later, I think that this is correct, that when David Williams was the athletic director, some students came and they wanted to name the phys ed facility after Perry Wallace. And he went, who's Perry Wallace? <laughs> and so David began the, the research and found out who Perry Wallace was and invited them back. And then they were tired of number and, uh, you know, he was ingratiated back in, well, with great apologies, he came back and, and, and was great for years and years with, back on campus. So. Christy, I, I, while we'll never walk in his shoes or experience what he experienced, it must have, I can only imagine the type of personality Mr. Wallace had to be able to endure what he endured. And like you said, several of, of you, the, the athletes or the student athletes at the time played pickup basketball or, or were friends with him. But it sounds like he never really shared a lot of during that time period, a lot of what he was subjected to. And I guess it, it, it I, I was just trying to put my, myself in, in your shoes back then. And then now coming forward, that maybe there is the, the, the feeling of, gosh, maybe we could have or should have done something back then. 
or, or been a better friend or whatever the feelings may have been. But again, not having lived through that time period, what could have been done differently from a administrative, from a uh, above the, the, at the university level that could have changed or would have been able to be changed. And I don't know that anything until it eventually, I guess, improved for the African-American student athlete. But I don't know, maybe I'm just speculating here, but it, it was any of that, I guess, some of the thought process in later years that- no. uh, Well, no, the hindsight's 2020 and you look back and, you know, I still couldn't come up with a university policy <laughs> to, to handle that time period. You know, what do you do? Um, I, I, here, here's one interesting note that um, there was a uh, Perry Walt, well, after Perry died, <clears throat> there was a ceremony held at, on Vanderbilt mm -hmm. campus and um, Godfrey Dillard was there, the other gentleman that came with Perry who did not stay. He left after his, I think, sophomore, early sophomore year, and he was injured his freshman year, so he didn't have the problems that Perry had. And so um, he left and went to school somewhere else, went to law school and has had a very successful career. But he came back to this uh, ceremony and I ran into him and I said, hey, uh, you know, what, what, what could we have done? He said, well, you could have come up to our room. <laughs> he said, there wasn't one athlete except for Pat Toomey that came to visit us. And Pat Toomey played football and basketball and later played for the Dallas Cowboys and became an author. But he was a, he grew up on military bases, so he got it. Mm -hmm. And there you go. I mean, if, if, if assimilating on paper is one thing, but getting people together, uh, having a reason to sit down and dialogue or talk and, and meet people, which you think you do in the line at Rand Hall or whatever, but you really don't. And so, I'm, you know, as little 18, 19 year olds that we were, mm -hmm. I'm not sure we were mature enough to understand what was going on. Yeah, I pop it, out, but we were mighty immature. Well, and, 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 and that's expected of, of college kids, 18, 19, 20 year olds, 21 year olds. And a lot of times we live through certain time periods where something is going on that we're not informed about, or maybe we should be informed about, or it's just kept from us for whatever reason. And until you look back or until you're notified or put on some type of, of notice, those things can get by you. And it's not just, just necessarily just uh, how an African-American athletes are handling societal issues on and off campus. But and guys, I'm talking with Christy Hout. We're talking about Perry Wallace and some of the early exper the experiences of some of the first African-American athletes on Vanderbilt's campus. And he certainly was uh, good enough to perform for uh, Vanderbilt on the sports court, on basketball court, and to, to do all the wonderful things he did on the field or on the campus in, in excuse me, in competition. But when the lights, you know, when the, the final buzzer goes off and the lights are off and there's no more competition, then how is the athlete treated? Then how is, and that's a little bit of what Christy is sharing. And I've read Andrew's book. I've interviewed Andrew about his phenomenally researched, painstakingly detailed uh, account. And, and I put a link uh, to the Amazon. That's the first one I came to if you want to purchase that book. And Andrew just did a phenomenal job with this. Christy, let me, let's, let's stay in that 66, 67, 68 uh, time period. And I know that by the time uh, Taylor Stokes came onto campus, uh, maybe it was that 68 or 69 or 70. I, I don't, I'm sorry, I don't remember exactly when. I have interviewed Taylor about his experience. He actually was the first 
person I brought on to conversations yeah. with Commodores, but much like my first conversation with you, Taylor and I didn't, we only scratched the surface. An hour really can't, you can't tell four years or a lifetime of experiences in an hour of time, but we did our best. We hit some of the highlights. Taylor was gracious to share some great stories, but do, were you guys teammates, I guess would be my first question about Taylor. Well, I was a senior when he was a freshman. And so he played uh, on the scout team as freshmen did because they weren't eligible in 69. So he had to play on the scout team. And uh, so I was in the defense secondary and he ran routes in practice that the opposing team was, was going to run. That, and um, Taylor took his licks. I mean, I'll, you know, he, he was a brave young man and a good receiver. <clears throat> and, but, you know, it's welcome to the SEC kind of thing. Yeah. And he was hit hard on cross routes. And after I left, I don't know that he ran cross routes again. I, I certainly would have been afraid. But uh, we, we, you know, it was a mentality of kill anybody that crosses, comes, you know, does a crossing route. Uh, so he, he earned his, his chops uh, for sure. And I'm so glad he came back and graduated and what a gentleman he is. He, he truly, he truly is. And for those of you who don't know Taylor's story, you should get to know it. Go watch my interview. There's other interviews that others have done, including the university did one a few years ago about his graduation and a little bit of his story. Taylor later, if I remember this correctly, later learned or earned a, a letter as a kicker. He was our place kicker for one season or maybe two seasons. Mm -hmm. And he tells an experience in our interview about the old Miss game. And it wasn't pleasant. In fact, it was exactly what you think it would have been. And he talked about how teammates dealt with that with him. And it really is a story that needs to be told. It's not told enough, but it's, it's as you've mentioned to me earlier offline, it's men like Perry Wallace, like Taylor Stokes, and so many others from the late 60s, early 70s, and all through the 70s, that others can stand on their shoulders. Yes. And by the time I came through in the mid to late 80s, it wasn't an issue. And now it certainly is not an issue, in my humble opinion. I'm not on campus, but I'm certainly not seeing or hearing anything from anyone who's there. I'm not saying the world's perfect. I'm not saying the Vanderbilt uh, athletic experience is perfect by any means from a race standpoint. But when I came through 20 plus years later in the eighties and now, you know, 30 years beyond that, it's the world has changed, at least in the yes. sports field, or at least I'd like to think that it has. Christy, yes. I know that you keep up with sports just like I do. And, and tell me some of your current observations. Do you see, do you have a similar viewpoint or do you see maybe that things are more complicated than maybe I'm painting it? Well, uh, history, uh, what I'm seeing is history repeats itself. This is nothing new. This is, you know, about every decade or two, you have uprisings and, uh, you know, um, so if you go back in time, um, you know, the, in the, the 60s was, there were riots, there were, you know, uh, all sorts of issues and they calmed down and then they come back and then they, calm down and so it's just repetitive and um but i i am just seeing with my grandchildren there, there is no race issue and i mean everybody's on the same page in the younger generations but then also my wife who grew up in indiana in an integrated high school, there wasn't, there never was. This is in the 60s. There never was a race issue. I went to her reunion and everybody's best friends forever, period. So, you know, how do we, how do we do that? Mm -hmm. uh, it, it's, it's an amazing kind of um, comparison. And, but, but I also don't want to leave out one fact that, that Vanderbilt financed a movie about Perry Wallace. And the movie is Triumph, the untold story of Perry Wallace. And it was not given distribution like it should have because it was too honest. So it's out there. And if anybody wants to look at, watch that, it's the true story, a great film 
and uh, but nobody would let it out because in the it was too honest about Ole Miss, Mississippi State. So the conference didn't want to back it. And uh, but it is a great film that shows the terrible things that happened, Perry, when he visited those those locations. So those are things we didn't know about at the time either. Nobody would write about them. Nobody came back on the trips and said, boy, you wouldn't believe what happened. It was it just uh, disappeared. So thank you, Andrew. Well, I, I, well, I just put a link, not to the movie, but actually mm -hmm. to a panel discussion about this film. Mm -hmm. And it's interesting. It's put out by the university, this panel discussion. Mm -hmm. It came out in 2020, just this past fall. And mm -hmm. on the panels, on the panel is one of my former teammates, Dr. Derek Payne, who was a, a running back uh, from Memphis. And I believe he is now either an oral surgeon or a dentist in, back in his hometown. But Derek is part of four or five different individuals who were on this, this panel. So I put the link to that. If I can find the link, how to either rent or watch uh, the movie, I'll certainly put that in there as well. Right. I think that's incredibly important uh, yes. that people learn more and more about Perry Wallace's story and the bigger story about how Vanderbilt dealt with it back then and how they've continued to deal with it over the last 30 or excuse me, the last 50 years uh, since. Well, and another issue, Vanderbilt was a regional school then. So there were, there were not many people from outside of the Southeast. So it was very much uh, kind of a closed society. Now it, it's a global university. So there's all over the world, there are students from everywhere. Very much, very much so from the general student population. And looking just from a, a football a student athlete standpoint, Vanderbilt has had to recruit all over the country. But we're not a big state school. We can't or haven't historically been able to bring in the top athletic uh, football players from our part of the country, we have to go to California, we have to go to Florida, Texas, New York, all over the country to bring players in each year. And if you look at the recruiting classes, you'll see that it is littered from probably a dozen states or so every single, every single year. But I want to point out two other observations, Christy. And again, this may maybe should be better for a panel discussion of maybe African-American student athletes from each decade and their experiences kind of sharing and comparing, but we'll save that for another day. But in 1988, Derek Payne was part of, I believe then, the largest uh, recruiting class of signees of African-American football players at one time. There was 10 or 11 uh, guys and they call themselves the fellas. And Derek Gregg, who is uh, if, if you guys know now, he's part of the NCAA. He is in charge or in part of, excuse me, he is head of the inclusion area of the NCAA's efforts to make uh, collegiate athletics experience more inclusive. And I applaud Dr. Gregg for that. But Derek Gregg and Derek Payne and Carlos Thomas and so many other fellows were part of the fellas. 10 or 11 African-American, just wonderful athletes and awesome fellows, and they're still very close. Then I want to say maybe 10 years or 15 years later, there was another very large class. I'm drawing a blank, and I apologize. There was another very large class of fellas, African-American athletes who also came in together and are also still very close friends. OJ, if you're still watching, buddy, I want to say, first of all, thanks for tuning in. But if you are still watching, please remind me I can't remember which recruiting class it was. It's a whole group of guys who are, again, a very successful group of African-American football players who are still very close together. My point in bringing up this, as you said, every 10 years or so, it seems that some things are starting to repeat in a good way as well. And I think the 88 class and then the class that then I can't think of the year, uh, maybe two of the very finest examples of how African-American athletes have come to Vanderbilt, played on the sports, or played football program, done well, competed on the field, and are certainly winning in life uh, off the field as well. And I'll get off my little, <laughs> my little uh, tangent there. But guys, I'm talking with Christy Hauk. We're talking about 
we're, frankly, we're talking a little bit about race relations and the African-American athlete and some of his observations back then. And, and now we've been really talking about Perry Wallace, we talked a little bit about Taylor Stokes and things. And I want to welcome Coach Gary Shepard, who is with us. He, he chimes in almost every week. Good evening, Coach. Glad that uh, Linda gave you some time off from the steak restaurant to join with us for a little while. Well, if you don't mind, I'm going to shift gears because mm -hmm. um, the most important story, mm -hmm. uh, best kept secret in Nashville, Perry Wallace certainly won, localized to Vanderbilt of sorts, but there is, there is a giant right under our noses that nobody knew anything about. John Pointer pointed it out to you in the interview about um, Coach Ed Temple. Mm -hmm. And if you don't mind, let me just tell you a couple of things. <laughs> this is the most amazing story that, um, in sports that I know of. And here we go with another Marinus. Andrew's father, David Marinus, mm -hmm. wrote a book called uh, Rome 1960, the Olympics that changed the games. Mm -hmm. And it was a fascinating look at the 1960 Olympics. First one to be televised live, first one to have sponsors, first one to have uh, drugs involved, um, many other things first, but <clears throat> it also was uh, the Olympic games where Wilma Rudolph in Clarksville, won three gold medals and um, David Marinus uncovered the story of Wilma Rudolph and her coach Ed Temple and uh, because of the times um, the, 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 there was um, discrimination in in the media because the newspapers just didn't want to cover small sports, TSU. Uh, they just didn't cover. And TSU was Tennessee a and before TSU, but uh, they hired this women's track coach in 1953 and gave him a $300 a year budget. And from that $300 a year budget, <clears throat> Coach Temple coached 41 years. He had 23 Olympic medal winners. How many coaches have won? He had 34 national championship teams. He had 30 Pan American game medal winners. He had eight national track hall of fame inductees. And he coached 40 Olympians. Again, how many have coached won? And all of his Olympians graduated. In his 40 years, he had one scholarship. Chandra Cheeseboro, his last year or two, got a scholarship and she won a gold medal in the Olympics. And of his 40 year plus period, 95 plus percent of his women graduated. And of those that graduated, half of them at least got their masters. And of those, about half of those got their PhDs. And of the whole 40 year group, less than 5% of the women uh, are not still married, they're divorced. So 95% success rate. And here's a guy that had a $300 a year budget and he would have to drive. They had no track meets. They would go to Tuskegee, Alabama to one year, one, one track meet a year or not more than one, but that was where the big one was. And they would drive down to, to Tuskegee and they couldn't stop at a guest. They couldn't stop to go to the bathroom. So he had to let them out in the fields to go to the bathroom. They had to pack their lunches because they couldn't stop and eat. And from that, he built this dynasty unlike anything in sports history. Totally overlooked by the media, totally overlooked um, by the university, TSU. Unfortunately, they were a football and a basketball powerhouse. And they wouldn't give him any money to do anything with because they said, you're winning all these gold medals. You don't need anybody. He didn't even have an office. He and his wife shared the post office where she was the postmistress. And they built this dynasty. And these women, these Tiger Bells, would come back 
uh, every year to have big homecoming celebrations. In, 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 in the, around 2000, a group of us in, uh, helped bring a marathon to Nashville, the Country Music Marathon, which is now the, music, the rock and roll marathon. And <clears throat> there was, this, there was, and as part of that, uh, and Royce Rizzer, former Commodore, Royce Rizzer, he was part of the team that, that brought it here too. But uh, we all got to do things at, at, at the event, and I got to drive the pace car. Drive the pace car. So we would peel off at the last mile, and then we'd go into the VIP tent where all the runners would come through. And there was always this older African American gentleman just sitting by himself, quietly, dignified, and he was waiting for his ride. And after a couple of years, I turned to the race director and I said, "Who's that?" So that's Ed Temple. He holds the finish line tape. I went, wait a minute, Coach Temple from, <laughs> yeah. So I went, oh, brother. It, nobody knew who he was. Every runner that came through there should have bowed down and kissed his ring. And he was just quietly just going home after the race. Um, so, because, and he never endorsed a product. Uh, and he had, he had no money in his budget. He would make speeches when he would get home from the Olympics. Now he, he was the Olympic coach for two Olympics, women's coach for two Olympics. He, he went to four or five Olympics. His, he has tons of gold medals and he was well known internationally, but in Nashville, he couldn't even go out to eat at a restaurant. I mean, that's how bad it was. And this was in the more of the fifties and early sixties. So um, he endured more, but he, he, cause the budgets were, you know, at TSU were started in the fall and football would get theirs and basketball would get theirs. And by the time they got to the spring sports, all the money was gone. So he would go out and make speeches and raise money and put them in the bank account for the women's track. And when he went to access the money, it was gone. The university took it and used it for other other things. So he goes to Rome and he wins <clears throat> all these gold medals. He blows a lid off of women's glass ceilings in sports. I mean, that was Wilma Rudolph was <clears throat> the most famous athlete in the world after the 1960 Olympics. And uh, he, he said on the plane ride back to his wife, he said, I, I know, you know, with all of this, I'm bound to get a raise and he never got a raise. And so it, 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 there was uh, discrimination inside, <laughs> there was discrimination outside, but he kept those women focused and they became the most successful group of athletes I've ever seen. So there are, I'm gonna hold this up. This is a, a DVD, you can't see it but it's called Mr. Temple and the Tiger Bells. And it was produced by a local uh, gentleman here. And it's been up for some awards, but it tells the story of Coach Temple. Now, what, what is amazing, nobody ever did a living history with Coach Temple. Nobody sat down, interviewed him. Tell us about your, your life and sport. Tell us what you did. No one ever did that. Fortunately, there was, there was a school in Franklin called New Hope Academy that <clears throat> asked Coach Temple to get involved. New Hope was started by a young lady who was doing outreach programs in the projects in Franklin and saw these kids that had no hope. So she started a school 25 years ago called New Hope Academy. It's the I have a dream speech in reality. Half the kids are underserved kids and half of them pay and they come together and they learn to love to learn and it's a christian school and coach temple came in and and uh, wanted to be a part of it he said there's so much of new hope in me and we started having banquets for him and all of a sudden he gets some radio play and then he was a greatest speaker he could tell stories better than anybody. And he sort of came out of his shell and finally got some publicity that he deserved. And I'll just tell you a quick story. He was in the 1960 Olympics and he was sitting on a bench. 
and um, in the Olympic Village, and a, a brass young man sits down next to me and said, "Who said who are you?" He said, "I'm Coach Temple, the women's coach." He said, "Who are you?" He says, "I'm Cassius Clay." He said, "I'm going to win the gold medal in boxing." And he said, "He rolled his eyes." And he said, "This this man's crazy." And he said, uh, and the buzz around was Floyd Patterson, the, you know, the world champion is here in the village. Aren't you, you know, everybody's rushing over to meet Floyd Patterson, a former medal winner. And uh, so he said, well, aren't you going to go meet the former champion? He went, no, I'm going to be the champion. So that was Cassius Clay. So a couple of years later, his wife is looking out the window here in Nashville and a guy drives up in a Cadillac convertible and knocks on the door and it's Cassius Clay and he's looking for Wilma Rudolph. And uh, they were in the same Olympics and they kind of dated on and off. But uh, Coach Temple has this great history. Well, New Hope Academy filmed six, eight hours of living history of Coach Temple. And it's in, it's part of this video, but it's a remarkable sports history that um, I've never seen the likes of it. And 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 David Marinus said he's the greatest coach of any sport of all time. So there's another meeting assignment. <laughs> wow, well that's that's phenomenal. And I put the yeah. link to Mr. Temple and the Tiger Bells, the movie. There's a website to it. So uh, perfect. Chris, thank you for bringing both of these uh, to our attention this evening. I, I was vaguely familiar with the TSU women's program, but I certainly don't know Mr. Temple's story. I'm, I'm well, not gonna learn it. Well, let me give you the Vanderbilt link to this. When Coach Temple got, became the track coach, they had three quarters of a track. Mm -hmm. the, the one quarter at the end had washed away. So they, they had to run three quarters of the way around, turn around and run back and they could they had they sprinted through their gym where you would hold the doors open on one building and then on the second building so they could do the 100 yard dash mm -hmm. well back then the men's track coach was herc alley and most of us know him as the phys ed head of phys ed or but herc alley was a football coach at vanderbilt with bear bryant very successful and he was a track coach and he let the Tiger Bells come and practice on the track at Vanderbilt and didn't, wouldn't tell anybody. It was a secret. And that helped them propel them to part of their dynasty by having a track to run on. So go Herc Alley. <laughs> you know, there's, there's stories like that that reassure that there's good in humanity mm -hmm. and you don't have to have the publicity. You just do the right thing. And yes. that's what makes society better. If you're not looking for that publicity, or frankly, even if you are, if you do the right thing, it just is for the betterment of the, the greater good. And guys, I'm talking with Christy Houck. He's given us some awesome uh, Tennessee, Nashville area sports history lessons tonight, lessons that really should be told over and over to more and more people. And they, they seem to all tie back to Vanderbilt. They seem to have ties uh, to our football program. And that's why we're doing these conversations, these conversations with Commodores to tell the oral history. And there's not enough of that. That's why I invited Christy back tonight to share part two of our conversation. I'll post a link to part one that we did a few months ago. And Christy, before I let you get out of here, we've got a couple of other uh, quick hitters, if you will, for us to, to kind of go over a little bit. I don't. Forgive me, I, I got three-fourths of the way through our uh, first conversation and I just ran out of time this afternoon. But I wanna ask you your experiences on the field competing against African-American athletes. I know there weren't that many. I know that this was in the early times of integration, but and particularly in the deep South where it just was painstakingly difficult and took so long. Did, do you have any recollections of competing against African-American athletes at the time? Well, uh, yes, but it's, it's funny. You, when you're on the field, you're not, you're not even, you pay no attention to that, period. There was never any att attention to that. And 
our freshman team, we played against Kentucky, who had the first integrated, those four men, mm -hmm. and we, we played them. But if you had asked me, well, but the day after the game, who was who, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't pay any attention. All I know is they just ran right all over us. <laughs> they killed us. And they were big, fast, bigger, faster, stronger. I just remember getting walloped by those guys. So I, I wasn't even, you know, you don't even think about it when you're competing on the field. Yeah. But then we played um, Michigan mm -hmm. our senior year. And that was Bo Schimbeckler's first year. And they weren't expected to be any good at all. And they ended up going to the Rose Bowl, winning the Big Ten. But we're the first game, and we go up there, and um, we come through the tunnel, and you, you go, you went side by side in those days, and you can't, everybody's grumbling, and we came out, and everybody runs out on the field, and one of their guys in the front stumbled, and everybody tripped over him, <laughs> comedic like, mm -hmm. and we went, we're gonna kill these guys. Well, I'm sorry, the opposite happened; they killed us, but. Most much of the team was African American. They were Reggie McKenzie, the All Pro, blah blah blah. But there was a ton of them, and it didn't matter one bit. They were just bigger, faster, stronger. <laughs> I, I'm looking at so I'm looking at their roster. Reggie McKenzie, of course. Uh, they have oh my gosh, there's 13 members of that team went on to play professional football, <laughs> and four of them are in the college. A uh, uh, Hall of Fame, College Football Hall of Fame, including Reggie McKenzie, Dan Deerdorf. Uh, Dan Deerdorf, yes. <laughs> yep. Let's see. Uh, Tom Curtis was a defensive back, and tight end was Jim Mandich. But Jim, yes. I want to. I want to go back to that Kentucky team real quick, Christy. I know that on their campus, they have commemorated, they have honored the memory of those four African-American founders, first, first uh, African-American scholarship athletes, uh, at least with the football program on campus. And it's a wonderful tribute. It's a very large, I don't know if it's bronze, but it's larger than life, but it recognizes them publicly in, in such a, a prominent place as well. I, I really think that's such a wonderful tribute. I wish more schools like ours uh, would do such a thing, but it's, I understand that there, there are certain reasons why you do, why you don't, but I just wanted to point out that I really think it is a, a pretty remarkable tribute to those men and what they did. And we, uh, you know, uh, Perry Wallace deserves, a statue is a constant reminder. And so is a Perry Wallace way, a street, but there's something visual, tangible about a statue that's larger than life. And there definitely needs to be one for Terry Wallace. And, uh, you know, I'll go with Taylor Stokes. I'll go with uh, many of the others that, that came along because they, you know, we have no clue what they dealt with. Uh, you're exactly right. And to come forward into to modern time, one of the things that I'm so very proud of, of our athletics department, of our university right now, is the job that, that Candace Lee is doing. She doesn't have, not everybody is a fan, but that when you're in, when you're an SEC uh, athletics director, you can't please everybody. You do what's best for the school. You do what's best for those who are involved. And I just wanna take about 30 seconds to just applaud her and her efforts. It's been about 12, 13 months since she was named as the, the permanent AD or at least the the act, not no longer acting, but it became her official title. And she's made a lot of hard decisions, some of which we'll never know about publicly, but you can see the changes. You can see the proactive nature and what she's getting done. She's made a lot of, of very difficult hires in new positions and some firing uh, in high profile positions. She's also come on with Chancellor Deer Meyer in public uh, interviews and press conferences in the last couple of months about the investment into the sports program that I programs, which I think is unprecedented from a monetary standpoint uh, in the school's history. So I just want to just give a little applaud, a little shout out to the efforts that she's doing 
and the athletics department is is doing right now? Absolutely. I mean, in my history, I, I don't know a, a smarter athletic director that we've ever had that gets it. And she's not out for self promotion. She's not out for the next job. Yep. She's digging in. She she bleeds the black and gold. She's a, a former student athlete. I think she is a three time. Um, uh, uh, not awards, but honors and degrees from our school. And mm -hmm. I may be right. I'm, I'm not sure if this is correct, but she may be one of only five African-American women who are athletics director of Power Five Conference Schools. All of those things to me are in the positive and I applaud it. And I look forward to the next thing she, she has to say about what she's doing towards our athletics department and to help our university. That's on your show, mm -hmm. June 17th, no, June, June 17th, yes, 17th. sir, we'll she all be, will be with us, so thank you for that plug and reminder, and yeah. Christy, I'll give, I'm going to give you the last word before we sign out and go watch Kumar take down the Razorbacks tonight. Well, um, as one of the elder invitees to your show, I would say, uh, respect your elders and do what you're told and read these books. <laughs> And I'm going to leave you with a couple of quotes of Coach Temple because they are so interesting. He said about his women, he said, you've got to look like a lady, you got to act like a lady, but you have to run like a man. And the last thing he said was, um, some people grow with success, others swell. And I just think that's very appropriate. So... I think that is, and that's sports or really anything in, in life. That's so, so very true. Yes. Well, Christy, again, it's, this is why I do these conversations every week. It's to have outstanding conversations with, frankly, outstanding people. And you are one of the very best. So thank you for your time. Thank you for sharing your experiences and your wisdom tonight. It's a pleasure, Bernard. Thank you so much. Looking forward to next week and the 17th as well. That's right, guys. I'm going to keep doing these each week. <laughs> and uh, you guys, anchor down. We'll see anchor you down. Thanks, bro.